Hi, this is Lawrence City Council Mark LaPlante. Our first clip this evening features the new Habitat for Humanity homes that are being constructed at the old St. Patrick's Convent on Parker Street here in South Lawrence. Here you'll find some of the workers and a couple of new people who are going to be moving into this complex when it's finished in a couple of years. Um, Habitat for Humanity in general is uh, an affordable home building organization. We're targeting homeowners who are, uh, who are not able to afford a house in the conventional mortgage market. Habitat does the financing with fundraising from foundations and corporations and individuals and we then uh, take the mortgages that are paid back at when the families purchase the homes and that money goes into building more affor affordable housing. And the way that we can keep this, the housing more affordable than probably any other home ownership program is that we build almost entirely with volunteers. We have ten families moving in here. Um, we'll have, let me think, we have two units downstairs, uh, three on the first floor, three on the second, and two more on the third floor. And they're all three-bedroom apartments except for one two-bedroom. All the families are selected by now? Uh, no, we've just started family selection for this because we think it's going to be a couple more years anyway before we get the project completed. So we don't want to select families too far in advance. Uh, if it drags on too long, uh, people can get disappointed. You know, it can be very hard to... to think about your new house and then it doesn't happen for multiple years. Better if we can select people and then they can do their sweat equity because all the families that we select, um, in addition to paying a mortgage, we don't require a down payment, but everybody puts in several hundred hours of work on their own home or another habitat home. Another family is here, a woman and her daughter, uh, and all, these families just started working within the past couple weeks. So, uh, yeah, we have two family members, one, one homeowner and one daughter working. Yeah, we're very excited about that. Um, the project is just getting going, so we know there's quite some time until it's finished. But um, so far, so good. Looks like it's moving along quickly. And what kind of things are you working on now? Um, installing foam, getting rid of everything that's um, like rotten wood and stuff like that. So getting all the debris out so that the flooring can be done. Yeah. That's what we're doing now. Yeah, this is the floor. Yeah. And can it help for somebody? Uh, I need help for something. Yeah, yeah put it uh, something in the, in the bowl. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is very nice. I like it. Now our second clip features the Veterans Outreach Center, which is based in Haverhill, Massachusetts. This outreach center does help Lawrence veterans. And here we have the executive director, John Radka, explain to us what's going on at the center. That there are differences between what the veteran service agent, let's say, in Lawrence does versus what your organization here does. Speak to me a little bit about the differences and what kind of the differences in services. Why would a, a Lawrence veteran contact you versus contacting a VSO in Lawrence? Well, we would recommend that every Lawrence resident, uh, veteran, or, or family member contact the Lawrence VSO for the services that the VSO could provide. Uh, the, some of the differences, or the difference may be that we have housing, and we have access to maybe some other benefits uh, that the Lawrence Veteran Service Officer doesn't have. Um, in particular, the Lawrence Veteran Service Officer may have uh, be able to assist with Chapter 115 benefits, which is a state-funded uh, and city-funded benefit program that could provide some dollars to uh, help them with support their daily needs. We have a food pantry, meals, housing, uh, access to uh, transportation, uh, and other veterans' benefits uh, readily available, so really maybe less wait time for some things. Uh, we, we refer people uh, to the local veteran service officers, and there's a cross referral that the local veteran service officers refer uh, veterans and their family members to us. My title is a uh, uh, grant administrator for the VWIP uh, Veterans Workforce Investment Program. Okay, so now you're a Laurentian, you're a Lawrence guy. Yes. So 
what is your role? I mean, tell me a little bit what your day-to-day -day obligations are and what kind of um, impact are you making with the veterans in the area? Well, um, a veteran, if a veteran is looking for employment, they would, they would see their local career center, um, speak with either Eric Nelson out of Lawrence or um, Bryn McLeod here in Haverhill for the Merrimack Valley. Those are the two career centers. Um, if they need as additional assistance as far as training, they would come to me. I would provide funding to them for extra training, maybe to, to get them to a marketable status for employment. Um, I also help with uh, vocational guidance, resume building, um, job placement assistance. The function of these two buildings here, this is a VA housing program. It's a transitional housing program. And uh, most of the veterans come to us, or just all of them come to us, referred by the VA hospital. And uh, the needs are many, and we help them with everything from uh, getting their health in check to helping them find a job or, or an income, uh, helping them find permanent housing. We help them with transportation. We help them with individual counseling. Uh, some folks may need counseling for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Some may need some family counseling. Some may, uh, whatever, whatever that type of counseling is that they need, if we don't provide it, we have the ability to refer them to someone who does. And behind us? Behind us is our permanent housing facility, 10 apartments, beautiful apartments. By the time you come to these apartments, none of our veterans in these apartments is receiving any subsidy. Uh, this, this building was built in 2003. It, uh, I've had very little turnover in the building. I could use five more of these buildings. In all honesty, I really don't know where I'd be without the VA or without organizations like this because I would probably either be on the street or, you know, I might not be around at all. Um, they've really helped me a lot. This organization itself um, has provided me with um, care. This is the second time um, I'm in between housing. Mm -hmm. I had my own apartment in Beverly, but things happened, and now I'm looking for housing again. So in between that, they took me back in, and um, like I said, I mean, I don't know where I'd be, you know, living otherwise without this organization. They um, they provide me with um, a roof over my head, with uh, food, clothing, and other, um, you know, necessities that I need. This third cliff features new fire chief, Jack Bergeron. Here at the Mount Vernon Neighborhood Association meeting, Chief Bergeron talks to us a little bit about the uh, priorities that he's facing as the new fire chief. What do you see to be some of the larger issues that we're going to need, you're going to need to deal with on the fire department? Well, right now we have 38 positions that are funded under a SAFER grant. And, you know, my most immediate concern is actually what are we going to do once that federal money runs out? It's my intention, uh, first of all, to reapply for that grant. Uh, you know, that grant application period, time period, has not opened up yet, but we will indeed do that. The likelihood of being able to get, you know, that huge amount of money that we got this past time, the $6.6 .6 million for a period of two years is, uh, I should be optimistic, but, you know, i, I got to be a little bit cynical and pessimistic considering everything that's going on in Washington with, you know, the elections coming up. And um, But again, you know, it's how are we going to continue to fund those 38 firefighters? And even with those 38 positions that we have funded, we're still not, in my opinion, you know, where we should be as a fire department. For a city of 70, 80,000 people, you know, at six square miles, uh, we really need to have more firefighters and more apparatus available to us. Many fire departments, you know, in the Northeast do run ambulances, provide emergency medical services, but uh, it's not as prevalent here as it is throughout the country. Just about every other section of the country, fire and EMS is a combined service, and that's where it should be here in Massachusetts, and particularly in Lawrence as well. And the reason for that is that Lawrence, you know, if the, the fire department, if we're providing that service, we could actually fund, you know, those, uh, those firefighters. Um, even right now, our number one call is emergency medical service. We respond, for instance, on what's known as a uh, advanced life support call, where someone is having a serious medical issue, something, for instance, like a stroke or a heart attack. The fire department, usually we're the ones that are 
the, we're the nearest ones available to respond. Our response time should be faster than anybody else. Right. And when you, someone's having a heart attack, there's a you know a critical window as to when CPR should be begun yep. in order to have a successful outcome to actually you know bring that person back. So again, it's it's all in all, it's probably the best. Not only for you know like for myself for keeping those firefighters funded, but also to provide the best possible emergency medical service for the city of Lawrence. Most people who actually reside in the city. One of the things that's made a huge difference over the years is smoke detectors, and I can't emphasize that enough, you know, that people need to know that that smoke detector that they have in their house, required by law, actually works. And it's very easy. They all have a test button on them, and I would suggest that people, you know, utilize that test button, test it on a regular basis. They should change the batteries in those detectors at least once annually. It's good to market, let's say, like, for instance, with the, we'd suggest maybe like Fire Prevention Week right around Halloween time or even better than that with someone's birthday. You know, you go and get, get a license or whatever, you know, change your battery and your smoke detector. Idea. Our final clip this evening deals with the Lawrence Licensing Board. Here, the Licensing Board debates whether or not to hand out a new alcohol license for a nightclub in Lawrence. If the city of Lawrence does not have the manpower and the police to patrol these establishments have had all kinds of problems with stabbings, overcapacitizing. We have the fire department checking on these establishments where we found five in violation. Right. Yeah, more I mean, they're supposed to have licenses for 90, under 100, 50. They got 250 for 50. They got 400 for 100. We're doing the job. The fire department's doing the job, and the officers are doing to the best of their capability. They're shorthanded. We're taking all kinds of letters, phone calls at home. This office has been swarmed. We have enough establishments in the city. I, myself, and I don't know how Myra's going to vote. It's up to her. We have to take the police department stand on. They're understaffed. There's nothing this licensing board or the police department can do. If they don't have the manpower to patrol the city, they have too many establishments in a small area. They've had stabbings, razor blade cuts. I mean, they've had 200 people in the street fighting. They do not have the manpower to control it. So in all due respect, I've taken your statement. I've listened to you both speak. I'm going to have to say that your license on my behalf is it has up to my that I will deny the license to the police department can tell me that they have adequate manpower to protect the city. Myra, we need a motion on this vote. No, well, the motion is still the same because, unfortunately, with only four more officers add up to the to the to the uh, police officer, I don't think it's enough to cover two more hundred people and another establishment. Unfortunately, I don't. I th I had to agree with the police officer's opinion. And you're going to speak on Avenue. What? Don Pedro's. Don Pedro's. And I've got a quick question regarding the Regas Grill. Did you post stay that to the next meeting? Yeah. Thank yes. Uh, been tabled, sir. Thank you. So very quickly, I don't want to take a lot of your time up. Uh, first of all, I think you did the right thing on your vote with respect to your position on the licenses, uh, dealing with what the police department had to say. So I commend you for taking that position because I think that's the right position to take. I also want to clarify or add a little more to what uh, the police uh, lieutenant said earlier. In 2010, we had 151 police officers. We went down 40. And in the last year or two, I know that the, the attorney's been reading some of the press releases from the third floor, but the fact of the matter is we have a net gain of eight. And frankly, one of those is a police officer that, uh, that's been in the newspaper that we're paying that's not even serving. So actually, we have a net of seven. So when we talk, that, yeah. so just to give a little bit of background and substance to what the police officer was saying, he's absolutely right. And I agree with him, and I agree with the police department stance on this. Uh, that's the facts. I just want to make sure that everyone was clear, and I want to commend you on your position. Thank you. And finally, just to catch up a little bit, the Budget and Finance Committee, of the City Council, voted unanimously the other week to approve the donation, the acceptance of a car from Cesar Camargo Sanchez to the Lawrence Police Department. I expect that we'll have a vote on this at our February 7th meeting.